Hello and a very warm welcome to today's Cell and Gene Therapy Insights webinar titled Targeting EGFR to Enhance NKT Cell Mediated Killing of Lung Cancer Cells. I'm Abby Pinchbeck, an editor at BioInsights, and joining me today are Tonya J. Webb, David Ferrick, and Stacey Shivertal, who will delve deeper into their case study testing the hypothesis that EGFRI treatment reduces cancer mediated immunosuppression, sensitizing the tumor cells to NKT mediated cytolysis. After the presentation, we'll have a live Q&A session with Tonya and Stacey, where we invite our audience to pose their questions to our speakers using the Ask a Question box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll try to get to these during the session. I'd also like to draw your attention to the resources tab on the right, where you can find more information on the topics covered today. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters. Dr. David Ferrick is the current Chief Scientific Officer at Axion Biosystems and has had 25 years of experience commercializing life science products into new and emerging markets based on nascent technologies. Dr. Ferrick received his PhD in Microbiology and Immunology from Georgetown University in Washington, DC. Dr. Chon J. Webb is a tenured associate professor at the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. She completed a doctoral degree in microbiology and immunology at Indiana University with studies focused on investigating the role of CD1D1 molecules and NKT cells in antiviral immunity. Stacey Shivertal is the Director of Product Management at Axion Biosystems. She earned a Bachelor of Science in Engineering from Mercer University and a PhD in Biomedical Engineering from the Georgia Institute of Technology and Emory University. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to David to kick us off with today's presentation. Welcome everyone to our webinar entitled Targeting EGFR to Enhance NK T-Cell Killing of Lung Cancer Cells. I will be your host. My name is David Ferrick and I'm the CSO of Axiom Biosystems. First, I would like to spend a couple of minutes introducing our tools and new solutions designed for immunotherapy, some of which our speaker today uh, will share data from. At Axion, innovation and ease of use have been core principles that have guided the design development of all our instruments. For those of you who know us, we started by measuring bioelectrically active cells like neurons and cardiomyocytes and rapidly became the number one platform to not just measure functional cells, but actually networks, circuits, organoids, and mini brains to really create a higher order of cell modeling uh, in the laboratory. In 2019, with the increased need for temporal resolution to do things like cytotoxicity and potency assays in immunotherapy, we were able to quickly pivot into impedance without even having to change our instrument. With a simple um, software switch, we can actually have multiple modes of measurement where we can measure an MEA, electroactivity, and the next day we can do a cytotoxicity assay, or we can actually do both in one experiment. And customers like in neuro-oncology and neuroinflammation have been surprising us every day. And it seems like we get a new application that expands the capability of this system. Today, we will focus on immunotherapy applications uh, where there's a need for more fit for purpose instrumentation. We're excited to have three such platforms all carrying the same fundamental architecture of this uh, label-free, highly functional measurement, but now in different systems that can address different parts of the value chain from research, discovery, to development, and even manufacturing. As we all know and appreciate, immunotherapy has changed the face of how we're intervening in disease, essentially going after the good guys. I think maybe it was Ron DePino uh, at MD Anderson, I, I first heard that phrase, uh, targeting the native host systems that have evolved miraculously over time. This requires us to have a much more adept biological tool bench than we have today. And as I've, we've been talking about all along here, real-time kinetic measures, um, it's really unfair to measure biology at a time point because biology occurs over time. And in order to measure over time, having non-perturbing label-free detection gives such huge advantages and objectivity to that measure. If you can actually do that, you can end up with more predictive, more relevant systems with which to measure, which we think we're starting to see. And that hopefully will lead to new manufacturing strategies that will lead to standards that will allow us to take these new modalities, especially cell therapy, these living drugs, and to better deploy and manufacture them in a more sustainable way. 
For those of you less familiar with impedance assays, uh, let me explain um, some of the reasoning behind its rapid growth and becoming what may become the new standard for doing cytotoxicity and other types of functional assays. It records all stages of the experiment and it does it in an objective way. It's not biased by any markers. It can measure many different attributes. It has great temporal resolution. It's very simple to set up. You plate your cells, you add your treatments, you're done. And actually label free not only uh, minimizes artifacts confounders and, and makes things more relevant, but in a compliant regulated environment, it's no calibration, no adjustments are needed. It can eliminate reduced critical reagents. It has a lot of features that make it a wonderfully objective assay that scores the same way every time. I would like to share with you just a couple of brief examples of what the data looks like. Here you can see a very straightforward CAR-T killing assay. Uh, and when you look at A, the impedance, you can see in orange, the tumor cell will grow and it will continue to impede as it grows. If you put T cells in at the vertical line, depending on their ability to target and kill the tumor, you will see the level of impedance drop. That can be converted and it's automatically converted into a cytolysis measurement, which is much more normalized and gives you the ability to better compare uh, different uh, cars and different constructs. After you gain some experience, it really gets exciting. The amount of information you can get from a single experiment is extremely rich. Here's just an example from a recent paper that shows how you can scrutinize individual time points where things change in very important material ways. It also reveals this kinetic, we've been talking about these kinetic attributes, in addition to just simple killing at a time point that really gives much deeper insight and ability to optimize conditions. And of course, at the end of the day, we really need the outcomes. We need to be able to quantify the threshold. When is there sufficient activity and or safety for the things that we're developing? I appreciate your attention and now would like to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Tanya Webb, who is an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. We got to meet Dr. Webb about a year ago at the ACR meeting uh, through a chance event where one of our directors had actually known her over 20 years ago. I guess they had crossed paths as students. Uh, and we were just at that time releasing the first ever potency assay for cancer tumor spheroids. That obviously created a lot of interest in a conversation that led to a collaboration uh, that led to some amazing data, which is so helpful to tool providers to validate um, our solutions. But it goes, it goes beyond that. Not only is Dr. Webb uh, an amazing young investigator and uh, professor, but even in the community outside of the lab, she's a mentor, she's a teacher, and at both the local and national level is an amazing example of inclusivity, diversity, and equity, uh, something that's important in our world today as we move together as a society. So again, I would like to thank you, uh, Dr. Webb, for joining us today, and I hand the mic over to you. Hi, my name is Tanya Webb, and I'm so happy to have the opportunity to share with you some of the work from my lab focused on targeting epidermal growth factor receptor to enhance NK T cell mediated killing of lung cancer. These are my disclosures. Our lab focuses on a unique population of T cells called natural killer T cells or NK T cells. And these cells display characteristics of both the innate and adaptive arms of the immune system. So like innate cells, once activated, NK T cells can rapidly exert their effector functions and they display proteins that are characteristic of natural killer cells. However, like T cells, NK T cells are activated through their T cell receptor in contrast to classic T cells, which recognize antigens presented in the context of MHC molecules, NK T cells are activated by lipid antigens presented in the context of CD1D. And a classic antigen used is alpha galactosyl ceramide or alpha gal ser. And what's important is that NK T cells have been evolutionarily conserved. So NK T cells are very similar across individuals. So if we develop a therapy targeting NK T cells, it can be used across many different populations. Due to their conserved nature, NK T cells are a promising target for cancer immunotherapy. This is because NK T cells can promote anti-tumor immunity in a variety of ways. Once activated, NK T cells can directly mediate cytotoxicity or kill cancerous cells. Not only that, following their activation, they rapidly secrete cytokines that can help activate natural killer cells. 
as well as induce the maturation of dendritic cells. These dendritic cells can then license cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And while they do hold great promise, their efficacy has been limited because NKT cells are suppressed in many cancer patients. And so incorporation into clinical trials has been limited. We know that NKT cells can play a key role in anti-tumor immunity based on studies like this from Dale Godfrey's group in which they compared tumor growth in wild-type and NKT cell deficient animals. And if you look here and compare wild-type mice shown in the black squares to the open squares in mice which lack NKT cells, you see rapid tumor growth in mice lacking NKT cells. In contrast, if you give NKT cells back, you see a dose-dependent reduction in tumor growth. I would like to reiterate that NKT cells are a promising target for cancer immunotherapy if we understand how to harness their potential. Because while NKT cells can directly kill tumor cells and activate other immune cells, NKT cells are reduced in cancer patients. So this is data from our cancer center where we compared healthy donors, patients with lymphoma, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. And what I think that you can appreciate is that across the board, NKT cells are reduced in number in patients. And these are just looking at NKT cells in the blood. However, studies from other groups have shown that if you treat with NKT cell-based therapy, this can result in a reduction in tumor progression in multiple myeloma patients, and this occurred in three out of four patients. In addition, in patients with head and neck cancer patients, all 10 patients that completed the trial had stable disease or either a partial response five weeks after the initiation of NKT cell-based therapy. Not only that, in lung cancers, it was found that 60% of advanced lung cancer patients that had highly active NKT cells had an increased median survival time. The median survival time was 29 months compared to patients that received standard of care in which their median survival time was only 4.6 months. So again, if we learn how to effectively modulate or activate NKT cells, they are a really a key target for cancer immunotherapy. So now you may be wondering, how can we restore or enhance NKT cell responses in cancer patients? And you may also be wondering, how does the cancer grow when you have an immune system that can recognize and destroy cancer cells? And so this leads me to the theory of cancer immunoediting, which has three phases, elimination, equilibrium, and escape. And so what happens is initially, when you have malignant cells, these cancerous cells can be killed by your immune system. However, sometimes these cancerous cells are allowed to persist, and so they're not eliminated, and a state of equilibrium is reached, wherein the cancer cell will downregulate antigens and molecules that their immune system uses to recognize these cancerous cells. And then the cancer cells will continue to undergo genetic alterations and express inhibitory ligands, secrete suppressive factors, as well as recruit immunosuppressive cells. And this is when they are allowed to escape immune pressures. And so when a patient comes to the clinic, it's in this escape phase, wherein the immune system is no longer able to control the growth of the cancer. So this is what we're focused on. Once the cancer has escaped immune pressures, we're wondering how can we target these cancers? Can we enhance NKT cell responses to lung cancer once the cancer has escaped these pressures? In these studies, we are focused on lung cancer because lung cancer is the most lethal and second most diagnosed type of cancer in American men and women. In addition, non-small cell lung cancer accounts for 85% of lung cancer cases, and 40% of non-small cell lung cancer patients have adenocarcinoma. So we used the A549 adenocarcinoma line in our pilot studies, and we wanted to compare traditional treatments to newer approaches. In addition to classic treatments like surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation, 
There are newer treatments like immunotherapy that uses the patient's immune system to fight the cancer, such as our studies using NKT cells. And there are other treatments that can specifically target a patient's tumor based on changes unique to that tumor. For example, many lung cancers use epidermal growth factor to grow. When epidermal growth factor binds to its receptor, the receptor homodimerizes or heterodimerizes with other family members, leading to tumor cell proliferation, apoptosis evasion, angiogenesis, and metastasis. As a result, epidermal growth factor has been a major target for treating advanced non-small cell lung cancer. For example, gefitinib and erlotinib in combination with cisplatin are first-line treatments for wild-type and mutated EGFR non-small cell lung cancer. While EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors such as gefitinib and erlotinib are initially effective, almost all non-small cell lung cancer patients treated with EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors eventually developed acquired resistance. EGFR T790M is the most common mechanism of acquired resistance, followed by mesenchymal epithelial transition protein amplification, HER2 amplification, and small cell histiologic transformation. Because patients develop resistant mechanisms like the T790M mutation, our goal was to test the effectiveness of chemotherapeutic agents like cisplatin in combination with EGFR inhibitors, a targeted therapy, along with immunotherapy. Our overarching hypothesis was that inhibition of epidermal growth factor signaling in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy would reduce tumor-mediated immune suppression and lead to enhanced NKT cell killing of the tumor cells. So in these pilot studies, we first wanted to determine if there was synergy between DNA damaging agents and EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors in their treatment of lung cancer. In these studies, we used the A549 and assess viability using the MTT assay. And if you compare the graph on the left, wherein cells were treated with cisplatin alone, you'll see there was a dose-dependent reduction in viability. But if you compare treatment with cisplatin and gefitinib alone to the combination treatment, you will see that treatment with cisplatin and gefitinib induces greater cytotoxicity. So we first asked if EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors work synergistically with DNA damaging agents to enhance killing of lung cancer cells. And to do this, we performed dose response curves with TKIs to determine if viability decreases when used in combination with cisplatin. Similarly, we found that combination treatment with cisplatin and erlotinib resulted in greater cytotoxicity than treatment with either drug alone. It's known that EGFR and vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF receptor, can share similar downstream signaling pathways. In addition to its role in promoting angiogenesis, VEGF can also potentiate an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment. So we were wondering if when we treat with the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors, are we also modulating VEGF? For example, we have examined the impact of VEGF on T cell and NK T cell activation. So on the left panel, I'm showing you DN32D3s. This is a mouse NK T cell hybridoma that was pretreated with VEGF and then cultured with antigen presenting cells. And what I think you can appreciate is that we saw a dose dependent reduction in IL2 production by NK T cells when they were treated with VEGF. Not only that, when we looked at primary cells by isolating liver mononuclear cells from C57 black 6 mice and stimulating T cells with either anti-CD3 CD28 beads or NK T cells with CD1D alpha-gal seroloaded beads, we found a significant reduction in their production of interfering gamma. Not only that, when we used human PBMCs, we found a similar decrease in response following treatment with VEGF. So these data 
demonstrate that VEGF can directly inhibit both NK T cell and total T cell activation. So now we go back to the question, does treatment with EGFR inhibitors reduce VEGF production by A549 cells? Interestingly, we found that treatment with all three drugs examined, cisplatin, gefitinib, and erlotinib, resulted in a decrease in VEGF production by A549s. And this happened if they were grown in a 2D monolayer or in 3D spheroids. We have observed synergy between DNA damaging agents and EGFR TKIs in the treatment of A549 cells. Not only that, we found a reduction in VEGF production. So now we wanted to compare the efficacy of combination therapy in 2D and 3D models. We wanted to study the impact of our treatment strategy using a more physiologically relevant model. And 3D spheroids have higher therapeutic resistance than 2D monolayers. And this is because the tumor microenvironment can be more hypoxic in a 3D model system. So in the next set of studies, we asked if the combination therapy was effective in 3D culture models. To create our 3D models, A549s were plated in ultra-low attachment plates for four days. We added the treatments for 72 hours and then added propidium iodide and hooks and stain for fluorescence. These are representative images showing that following drug treatment, the majority of the cells are dead. In these studies, A549 spheroids were treated with cisplatin, gefitinib, or in combination, and then stained with PI and hooks. And what we found was that treatment with cisplatin and gefitinib resulted in greater cell death compared to treatment with gefitinib alone. These studies made us realize that we need more sensitive methods to reliably detect viability. So we initially assess viability using MTT and PI and hook staining. However, the quantitative assessment was modest at best. And so we tested the sensitivity levels of additional assays, the cell titer glow assay, as well as the maestro resistant plates. To really highlight why we needed more sensitive methods like the maestro impedance assay, please look closely at these data that you've seen before. While in the images above, you can clearly see that most of the cells are dead, this is not reflected in the viability curve, highlighted by the arrow. Using the cell titer glow assay to assess viability in our A549 spheroids demonstrated that combination treatment resulted in greater levels of cytotoxicity. Importantly, we also found that cell titer glow was much more sensitive than PI hooks. In addition, when we compared our 2D cultures to our 3D models, we found that the 3D spheroids were much more resistant to cisplatin than a 2D monolayer. Similarly, we found that the 3D spheroids were much more resistant to cisplatin and erlotinib than a 2D monolayer. And this was true for erlotinib as well as gefitinib. So if you look here and again compare our 2D cultures to the 3D cultures, the 3D spheroids were much more resistant to treatment. Now that we've developed our model systems, we're back to our original question. Can we enhance NKT cell responses to lung cancer? It has previously been shown that combination treatment with EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors and immune checkpoint blockade can increase immune cell proliferation. So in these studies, proliferation was measured by assessing KI67 expression, and the authors examined CD8 T cells, CD4 T cells, NK T cells, and gamma delta T cells. And what I really want you to focus on are these bars in yellow and green. And what you can appreciate is treatment with the EJFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor or latinib and in combination with anti-PD-1, you see a significant increase in KI67 expression. 
Not only that, there's currently a phase one, phase two clinical trial ongoing to investigate the efficacy and safety of NKT cells in combination with gefitinib for their treatment of advanced EGFR mutated non-small cell lung cancer. And this group reported data on one patient. So in this study, a patient diagnosed with stage four adenocarcinoma was treated with chemotherapy and bevacizumab, an antibody against VEGF. Then the patient received gefitinib treatment and then gefitinib in combination with NKT cell therapy. After that, the patient received resection of the right lower lobe of the lung and had a stage one diagnosis. And then the patient stopped receiving NKT cell-based therapy due to issues with the pandemic. Later on, they were able to continue treatment. And then the study is shown in more detail below. Importantly, the patient is still alive. So our in vitro assays will allow us to examine the mechanisms responsible. So in these studies, we move forward with the Maestro Impedance Platform, and we played in A549s in low attachment plates and spheroids grew. Then we transfer the spheroids to the Maestro plates. The spheroids will attach and resistance and viability will increase. Then we can add either drug or NKT cells or both, which would result in cytotoxicity. And then we can measure this using the impedance assay. So using the master system, we are able to measure viability by measuring resistance. And so we wanted to conduct a study to look at specificity. So in these studies, the A549 spheroids were treated with EGF plus or minus EGFR inhibitors. And we found the spheroid viability was inhibited when we treated with the EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors and the presence or absence of epidermal growth factor. So now that we have a system in place, we can finally investigate the effectiveness of combination therapy, chemotherapy, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy in our 3D models. First, a little background on immune checkpoint inhibitors. So the immune system is regulated by a system of checks and balances. The immune system wants to stay in homeostasis. So once you have a strong response, there are signals to dampen that response. For example, naive and memory T cells express high levels of the cell surface protein CD28, the positive co-stimulatory signal, but they do not express CTLA-4. And then following activation through the T cell receptor, CTLA-4 is quickly upregulated, and the stronger the stimulation through the T-cell receptor and CD28, the higher the amount of CTLA-4 that is upregulated onto the T-cell surface. And this happens in the periphery. In contrast, within the tissues, the major role of the program cell death protein PD-1, or the PD-1 pathway, is to regulate inflammatory responses in the tissues. So activated tissues will upregulate PD-1 and they will continue to express it in the tissues. And inflammatory signals in the tissues will induce the expression of PD-1 ligands, which downregulates T cell activation. And so immune checkpoint inhibitors are antibodies that target these negative signals in order to restore T cell responses to tumors. There are several immune checkpoint inhibitors in development. The inhibitory and stimulatory proteins, which are currently being targeted by FDA-approved monoclonal antibodies or next-generation immunotherapeutic drugs, are highlighted by red and green dots, respectively. So remember, our original question was to see if we could restore NKT cell responses or enhance their responses to lung cancer. So we wanted to check for these positive and negative signals, being that the negative signal could be blocked. So NKT cells are activated by lipids presented in the context of CD1D. So we first checked to see if A549 cells express CD1D. And as shown here in the black histogram, we observed high cell surface expression of CD1D. We also examined PDL1 levels and found that the A549s expressed intermediate levels of PDL1.
In this set of experiments, we treated A549 cells with drugs in the presence of increasing numbers of NKT cells expanded from a healthy donor, as shown on the x-axis. And while we observed a reduction in viability following treatment, the addition of anti pd one did not appear to enhance cytotoxicity. In contrast, when A549 cells were treated with increasing concentrations of gefitinib, the addition of NKT cells further enhanced cytotoxicity. So if you'll focus here and compare the green line, which includes NKT cells, to the black line, you see that just the addition of 20,000 NKT cells resulted in an increase in cell death. So in summary, hopefully I've convinced you that treatment with cisplatin in combination with EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors decreases the viability of A549 cells cultured in both 2D monolayers and 3D spheroids. In addition, we found that treatment with cisplatin, erlotinib, and gefitinib decreases VEGF production. And we were able to nicely show using the maestro that 3D spheroids were more resistant to cisplatin and EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors than 2D monolayers. And while we did not observe a difference in cytotoxicity with the addition of anti pdl one monoclonal antibody, we did find that treatment with gefitinib increases NKT cell mediated killing of lung cancer cells. Now you may be asking, how can we leverage the Maestro Impedance platform to help further advance the field of immuno-oncology? Well, I believe that it can be used in diagnostics, therapeutics, and precision medicine. I think that it can be combined with imaging to assess NK T-cell or classic T-cell extravasation into 3D cultures. In high-throughput drug screens, it can be used to assess cytotoxicity and spheroids, and the supernatants can be collected and used for multiplex cytokine analysis. In addition, the soups can be used to assess metabolites, and the residual cells can be further analyzed using genomic approaches such as RNA-seq. Moreover, the maestro impedance assay can be used to test the efficacy of CAR T-cell approaches and other immunotherapeutic strategies such as bispecific and trispecific T-cell engagers. Also, importantly, it can be used to assess or address cancer health disparities. So, for example, if differences are observed in cancer cell death, these cells can be further analyzed using mass spectrometry to assess differences in proteins and lipids. And lastly, I would like to thank my lab because, of course, I wouldn't be able to do any of this without an amazingly supportive team, particularly Aditya, who did most of this work during his master's studies. Thank you so much. And I also would like to thank the Axion team for allowing us to demo the Maestro. We were able to get amazing work done within a relatively short period of time. I would like to thank you for your time and attention and would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you so much, Tonya and David, for that great presentation. We're now going to start our Q&A with Tonya and Stacey, so do feel free to send in any questions that you may have for them. And we will try to get to these during the session. So, Tonya and Stacey, if you'd like to join me back on camera. Um, I've got the first question here, and this one's for you, Tonya. What are some of the challenges of working with a 3D model? Okay, while we're waiting for Tonya there, I'll move on to a question that we have for Stacy. Stacy, how do you know the signal that you're recording on the Maestro Z is from the cancer cells and not the immune cells? Thanks, Abigail. That's a great question. Um, so the impedance measurement is actually sensitive only to the cells that are attached to the electrode in the bottom of the well. So, for example, in Dr. Webb's experiments, the lung cancer cells or the 3D spheroids were attached to the electrode, and those are what are generating the impedance signal. The immune cells, which are non-adherent, um, generate very little to no impedance signal when they settle down and just rest at the bottom of the well, but aren't truly attached. So you can be confident that the changes in impedance that you're observing in an experiment like this are due to the behavior of the adherent target cells and not the immune cells. 
But that said, I'd like to add that actually you can use impedance to run a similar potency assay using a non-adherent target cell or a liquid tumor model. Um, in order to do that, you would first attach the target cells to the electrode using an antibody coating to tether those cells to the surface. And then once they're tethered and in close proximity to the electrode, you run the assay just as you can with adherent cells and you'd see an increase in resistance as they grow and a decrease when they're killed by the immune cells. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you so much, Tonya. Looks like, um, Stacey, it looks like we've got Tonya back now. Um, so Tonya, I've got a question here for you. What are some of the challenges of working with a 3D model? Oh, yes. So we really enjoyed working with a 3D model, but it could be a little challenging because it was hard to get an equal number of cells per well. And so we tried different strategies of adding multiple spheroids. Uh, we tried combinations of two or four. And also there's a seeding effect. When you plate the cells, the uh, spheroid grows out. And so you have this outer rim. And so in being able to have a representative grouping of cells uh, could be a little bit challenging, but we were able to uh, work around this. Great, thank you. And another one for you, Tonya. Have you considered creating more complex spheroids with additional cell types, matrices, or other aspects of the tumor microenvironment? Yeah, so actually we have. So the data that we focused on here was on lung cancer, but we've also done multicellular spheroids with ovarian cancer, wherein we use fibroblasts as a stromal support system in combination with the tumor cells. And then we could add in the drug and NKT cells, and we were able to get really nice data using those other models. Great to hear. And are you exploring NK NKT cell therapy for other cancers in addition to lung cancer? Yes, as I just alluded to, we're doing some work with ovarian cancer. We have similar studies with uh, breast cancer, and we also work on some hematological malignancies like uh, lymphoma, B-cell lymphoma. Great. And why do you think anti-PL1 did not have any effect? Also, we think that the lack of seeing differences with using anti pdl one could be for numerous reasons. We're not sure if within our spheroids, pdl one was downregulated when we added in the NKT cells. And if it was downregulated, then we wouldn't see that big of an effect. We're not sure if we added in enough antibodies. So Aditya did some studies using different concentrations, but we may need to further optimize the assay to get the results that um, we expected. Brilliant, and staying with you here, Tonya. What do you think the mechanism is for the enhanced NK NKT efficacy in combination with EGFR inhibitors? Oh, so that's a great question. Thanks so much. So we really think that there are multiple inhibitory factors that the cancer is using to evade NKT cell detection. And so we think that the reason why we're seeing this enhanced killing is not only because of we're targeting EGFR, but we're also getting a decrease in VEGF. And so the tumor isn't able to proliferate or grow as well because we're targeting VEGF and EGF. And this is also decreased the amount of immune suppression that the cancer is able to induce. And so we think that we're able to target multiple factors using this approach. And that's why we see this enhanced killing. Yeah, that makes sense. And back to you here, Stacey. All cells in a spheroid are not attached to the surface. So how accurate for the immune assay for spheroids? Yes, that's a great point. Of course, in a, in a 3D model like this, only the bottom uh, portion of that spheroid is attached to the electric, and that's the part we're measuring from. But we found um, that the T cells or immune cell NKT in this case tend to attack that spheroid from all sides. And you see the spheroid shrink accordingly as it's getting killed by those cells. And the impedance measurement is directly correlated with this the size of the spheroid. So as the spheroids are bigger or, or growing, you see an increase. And as the spheroids are shrinking or being killed, you see a decrease. So we feel confident that we are measuring accurately uh, the killing of that spheroid, even with this 2D planar electrode. Great. And back to you now, Tonya. 
since there are several anti-VEGF therapies on the market, do you think any of these may have similar effects as the EGFR inhibitors? Well, we've tried uh, several VEGF inhibitors. We've tried um, bevacizumab, the antibody. We've also tried um, genenstein, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And we do think that we could use a VEGF inhibitor in combination with an EGF inhibitor and see a greater effect. Great. Thank you, Tonya. And another one for you here. Do lung cells from patients express CD1D molecules? That's a great question. We haven't tested it in our hands, but based on the literature, yes, lung cancer cells, primary cells do express CD1D. So we do think that this is a great way to target lung cancer. That's great to know. Thank you so much, Tonya and Stacey, for answering those questions today. That's unfortunately all we've got time for, but any questions that we didn't manage to get to, we will reply via email. The webinar will be available on demand tomorrow, so look out for an email from us with the link. All that's left is to thank Tonya, David and Stacey once more for a great presentation with us today. And thank you to our audience for listening. We hope you'll join us again soon.